went on, on the, I would say, in a very personal way on the, on the warpath about all of that and tried to turn it into a series of arguments that suggested that Bill was trying to undermine affirmative action for middle class blacks. Well, that's nonsense. That's never what uh, his argument was about. And he gave as well as he got in those arguments. Um, so his political economy argument, I take it, is this. It is a fusion of Weberian and Marxist analysis. It takes class relations and labor market realities as basic and central, but also argues, I think, with less detail that that intersects with a separate set of political um, dynamics. And he divided, as I'll remind everybody, American history into three major eras of race-class intersection, the pre-industrial antebellum and immediate post-Civil War era in which he saw a fusion of economic and racial domination that pivoted on the role of white slaveholders or immediate ex-white slaveholders in the American political system. The period between 1875 and the New Deal, which he called the Industrial Period, in which he saw um, both North and South as racializing politics in different ways in the North because of the competition between black and white um, workers and poor people that the ascendant managerial corporate class was able to exploit. He didn't say too much about the politics to that during that period, but I think you can infer that it was a period in which those corporate forces had pretty much unlimited sway in his analysis. And then the modern industrial period, post-World War II, uh, where he argued that the class mobility prospects, and I think that's what it was really about, um, for blacks as well as whites were increasingly based on educational attainment. And um, they became more decisive for individuals and families' life chances than simply their racial category. But that left the underclass, or the, the poorest of people, particularly African Americans in the central cities, in especially isolated and dire straits uh, as the industrial order gave way to a more educational and service-oriented economy. He saw in this period, he argued, writing in the 70s and 80s, that black-white worker competition was in some ways lessened compared to the pre-New Deal period by the expansion of government. And he talked about it both in terms of New Deal policies, but also employment, which was very important for the black middle class, and the rise of strong unions, which was also supported by uh, government policy. I think what was very important about this analysis and very prescient even for today in new forms is that Bill recognized the new realities for the upper middle class in the United States. It's very easy for all of us in liberal universities to talk about the top 1% and how awful they are. The fact of the matter is the top 20% in both black and white ranks lives a very different life from other people. And Bill actually was the first <laughs> to finger that. That's now a, an important theme in terms of inequality. Um, his policy uh, conclusions for the 1980s, which I'm going to read just from the, the uh, truly disadvantaged, uh, he argued, for all the reasons that have been laid out in the analysis that I've talked about in his, a comprehensive program of economic and social reform highlighting macroeconomic policies to promote balanced economic growth and create a tight labor market situation, um, as we just heard, a nationally oriented labor market strategy, a child support assurance program, and a child care strategy and family allowances program would have to include targeted programs, both means tested and race specific, but the latter would be considered an offshoot of, and indeed secondary, to universal programs. The important goal is to construct an economic social reform program in such a way that the universal programs are seen as dominant and most visible by the general public. As the universal programs draw support from a wider population, targeted programs included in the comprehensive reform package would be indirectly supported and protected. Now, let me just 
wrap up by saying, I think this two-track way of proceeding with public policy informed both the Clinton presidency and the reforms of welfare, and moving away from cash welfare grants to a few of the very poor, in particular family situations, toward a more universal set of income supports that Bob Greenstein has just described for the poor and the near poor. And it also was at the heart of Barack Obama's presidency and his support for the Affordable Care Act. There are some very great vulnerabilities in the targeted parts of that, and even in the universal parts that purport to fill in the gaps, for example, in a healthcare system, because those gaps mainly affect low and lower middle income people who are disproportionately of color. And so they're easily tarred as welfare, even when they're not welfare. Um, but the main thing I would say is we need to step back, like Bill did in his work, and see that the political ground he was assuming might still be there, and which looked like it was coming to a full flower under the Obama presidency, has shifted in ways that raise new challenges, but suggest that this approach is going to have to be backed in new ways. Labor unions have been targeted by a radicalized Republican Party that in many ways was captured in the early 21st century, but from the 1990s on in other ways, by the wealthiest 1%, promoting an anti-government, free market approach to our political economy. They have succeeded and destroyed the organized power and the ability to build racial bridges of much of the organized labor movement. That, in turn, has weakened the Democratic Party. And secondly, racial controversies have shifted in new ways. I think many of us believed when Barack Obama was elected president that we had passed a milestone and would not go back. I know I did, briefly, and I, that was so naive. It was so naive to think that. Because his election as president has provoked, angered, and created fear in wide sectors of the white middle class. It's not working class we're talking about here. It's white middle class people who live mainly outside of metropolitan areas and the coastal states. They were the backbone of the Tea Party. They are the hard core of the Trump enthusiasts. And they're frightened about the identity and social contract of the country as a whole in a period where they see their own communities decaying, although they're not in bad shape personally. That's, that's the mistake many of us make. That has been exploited by the ethno-nationalist strand of Tea Party politics and Trump politics and is now fused in a totally radicalized Republican Party that raises fundamental questions about whether the Democrats will even be in a place to have a debate about the things that Bob Greenstein is talking about. So I'll leave you with that thought. I believe, <laughs> I believe that, <laughs> I think that if there was anything missing in Bill Wilson's magisterial portrayal, it was enough of an analysis of what was happening on the right in American politics and the nature of the fight that uh, has to be won in 2020, 2022, and 2024 to recreate the ground on which discussions can go on about how we blend universal and targeted uh, in our effort to create opportunity and security for all Americans.
Which one? This is not going to go. Okay, oh, there goes for it. Oh, okay. At least we won't lose our seats. Okay, um, let me say, first of all, um, what an honor it is to be here. Um, I was a graduate student of Bill's at the University of Chicago. Uh, uh, he was a member of my dissertation committee. Uh, I was in political science. I was not a sociologist. And um, although what Theta says about Chicago at that time is true, it is also true that my colleagues were investigating and learning about rational choice and methodological individualism. And I came to study you know, problems of poverty and employment and communities. And I thought, oh my god, what have I gotten into? <laughs> and I was so thrilled when Bill agreed to be on my committee. Uh, and I should say, in all fairness, that Theta was also on my committee, so I was a very lucky person uh, in that regard. And I know we're not supposed to tell any personal stories, but I just tell one little one is that, you know, it was a really great atmosphere at that time. And I remember being at Gary Orfield's house with Theta and with Bill, talking about basketball. And Bill, you got up and showed us how to do a pick and roll. <laughs> 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 And I just, I just thought, OK, maybe I can do this academic thing. Maybe it'll be OK. So you know, I came to grad school. I was from Erie, Pennsylvania. And I was watching deindustrialization. And that's what I wanted to study. And so I was drawn to Bill for his work on the centrality of employment and his um, emphasis on employment and what it means for people to be established their lives, to uh, root their communities, had a big impact uh, on me. So the question I asked in my dissertation is, why, if the United States purports to care so much about work, why do we do so little in terms of labor market policy? Why do we do so little to help people get back into the labor force? And so, and, and why are public jobs off the agenda? So those are some of the things that I was interested in. And I just wanted to show you a couple of things um, uh, the archival work I did was to think about the framing of employment policy during the 1960s, during the war on poverty. So this is the heyday of macroeconomics, that we can tune the uh, levers and lower unemployment. And unemployment, 1966, was 3.8 percent, 3.6 percent. But the Labor Department was starting to understand unemployment and employment problems in a different way. And so this is from the Manpower Report of the President. They were beginning to look at the issue of subemployment. It was before there was a measure uh, for underemployment in the United States. And you can see they went into black and Latino communities, San, uh, San Antonio, um, Mission Fillmore in uh, San Francisco and found that there were high rates of what they called subemployment. And so some of the components were unemployment, because of course, even when unemployment is at 3.6%, and you can look at the rates, it's the, the black uh, uh, part of the bar there. Um, those rates are, of course, double and sometimes triple uh, in the black and Latino communities. Um, but they also looked at part-time work, sub-minimum wage earnings, uh, and non-participation in the labor force. So the Labor Department was struggling at that time to understand the problem of uh, unemployment. Um, and um, they uh, failed to make an impression on the economists who were in charge of economic policy who said, that's a social problem. It's not an economic problem. And in branding this set of economic problems as a social problem, that kind of framing had uh, an extremely important impact because it paved the way for behavioral arguments about the reasons for higher levels of disengagement from the labor market. And it set the stage for thinking of these as simply problems that are individual 
behavioral problems, not problems that have something to do with the structure of the economy, due to individual failings, not the structure. And so part of what uh, Bill's work was important for me was looking at that uh, structure. I would say that you know there was a brief period in the 1970s when there were public service jobs. Some people might remember the CETA program, Comprehensive Employment and Training uh, Program. Um, and in a way, we sort of forget about that era of, of public jobs. Um, it was ended quickly by Reagan. It got a, got a lot of bad press while it went on. And um, I, I had a call about, it was about two years ago, it was from a journalist who was, he was writing a book about gangster rap in, on the West Coast and the emergence of it. And I thought, oh, <laughs> glad he's calling me. Uh, <laughs> but, but what he... What he wanted to know, what he wanted to know was that he said, I've been doing all these interviews in LA, and what people are telling me is that it was the end of the CETA program. The end of the CETA program made such a big uh, impact in these low-income black communities in Los Angeles, and that this frustration, and that, you know, this is the West Coast gangster rap in a way came out of that, and he wanted to know, was CETA a big deal? And I thought, you know, I don't know if anybody has actually done a study of, you know, what CETA did in those communities. I had some of that in my book, but also what, what the end of it meant. But so I think it's important to remember what the, the, the full range of some of the things that we try to do uh, in that era. And uh, I want to say just one thing, and then I want to, I have one other smaller thing I want to say, um, one other thing I want to say, but just in thinking about targeting and universalism, I think also we are poised for, uh, you know, I was trying to think of a name for it, something like a politics of repair that could attract and is attracting widespread support. And it's about repair of the labor market, repair of the kind of jobs that people have, how they don't combine with people's lives. And you can see it in um, uh, cities. I mean, one of the things about our politics now is partly what Theta was describing of, you know, this very radicalized Republican Party. But of course, we have very blue cities. And in those cities, people are voting for things like higher minimum wages. They're voting for things like scheduling so that people can have um, more uh, kinds of um, reliability uh, in their work schedules. Uh, they're voting for things uh, like family leave policy. California is just trying to, with the law they passed, just trying to um, uh, restrict what uh, uh, the Ubers and the Lyfts can do, contract employment. So I think we are poised. I don't think it will be easy. But I see that as a policy that can attract widespread support. It affects so many people across the board, and even people who ultimately get steady jobs. Many people know what it's like to live uh, at, the, at the whim of an employer. You know, my brother had some job, and he needed extra money, and he's a conservative, and he lives in Texas, but he had a, got a night job at Home Depot, and he was there, oh, it's great, it's great. And the, you know, by the end of his extra job at Home Depot, he, like, threw his apron down and walked out. It's because, you know, they, they so, Anyway, you get my point. People know about what these jobs are like. And I do think that presents an opportunity to build uh, broader support for disciplining what employers have done uh, to jobs in the United States. So, uh, so that's one you know, way in which I think the future in thinking about politics I want to uh, also, I wanted to say a little bit about one other aspect of thinking about the future in Bill's work, and this relates to work that I've been doing on the suburbanization of poverty uh, in the United States. I mean, one of the things we know in recent years is that uh, low income people, uh, the majority in terms of numbers of low income people, live in suburbs, and I put the suburbs in quote. Uh, quotes, um, because that is such a big term. We don't know what it means. And this is especially the case in the Sun Belt. So Bill's work was on Chicago. It's on the city, Northeast and Midwest. And I think our future work, we need to learn a lot more about the suburbs. What does it actually mean that these places are called suburbs? Uh, and we need to know about Sun Belt cities. And so th that's uh, a little bit of the work that I've been trying to do. And I just, I'll just uh, flag some of it, some of the kind of questions that 
I'm asking. So um, the questions I'm asking this project is wh what kind of local government is it? What kind of capacities does that government have? What kind of organizational assistance is available in these places? One of the things we know about suburban places and the Sun Belt, that their histories are entirely different from places like Chicago, places like uh, New York. Um, so I'm studying it and trying to understand both what the governments are like, what the local governments are like, and what the organizations there. And I'll just say a word about the governments uh, and that research. So governments matter. What kind of local government you have, the size of the public tax base, do you have insured access to important block grants, like the community development block grant? It goes to places that are automatically over uh, 50,000 people. If you live in a smaller city, you have to compete to get that money. Also, the uh, home grants. So uh, what about your federal grants? And also, what kind of services do you have? The end of cash assistance with Kathy Eden talked about yesterday makes uh, services all that more important. I'll just show you some of the research that I've done with a former grad student at Berkeley. And we started looking at what kind of governments are there that people in these low-income people in these suburbs have. And one of the things that our research, we looked at 26, 25 large metro areas across the country between 1990 and 2014. Poverty as a share of the whole metro area Chicago, it declined by 20% in Chicago. The poverty rate is still higher in Chicago. The share of low-income people living in these cities in St. Louis declined by 14%, by 22% in Detroit. So where are people going? And what our research found is they're, they're go the, the story is different in different regions of the country, which means we have to start thinking about place and government in, in different ways. So in the Northeast and Midwest, we found that they are going to these smaller political jurisdictions of under 50,000 people. Well, what's wrong with that? One thing is that those, people, those places have a smaller tax base. They don't uh, tend to combine a, a broad uh, tax base like larger places do. As I said, they don't receive these key federal grants. The other thing that's wrong with it is that many of these are small, high-poverty cities, and particularly the case in places like St. Louis and Chicago. So St. Louis has 273 suburban cities, and 71 uh, of them are high-poverty. We define high-poverty as over 20%. These places are subject to uh, downward spirals of high taxation, poorer services, high taxation, poorer services. Um, they are also disproportionately African-American and the same uh, situation in St. Louis and Chicago. In the South, it looks different, and I think of it as actually really in both of these cases, out of sight, out of mind, that poverty has grown in unincorporated places. So these are places that don't have an overlying uh, municipal government, but they're subject to the county government. And... Um, uh, and poverty in these southern places, and we have a few examples there, has grown in these unincorporated places. This, sometimes you think of unincorporated places, oh, that's just like on the edge of the metro area. But what these are, it's more like a Swiss cheese metro where places form a government, but they leave out the poor areas. Or Houston annexes, but it annexes the rich place and leaves aside the poorer place. So you get these kind of Swiss cheese metros that leaves low-income people at the um, subject to county government, which uh, is often unable to raise taxes, may be restricted by the state from raising taxes, very hard to get political voice. And it's one of the complaints in um, St. Louis County is very uh, unresponsive to um, African Americans and low-income people. They're also subject, they have no control over land use, so they're also subject to all kinds of uh, environmental dumping. So, in, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop right there, but it seems to me that um, a future agenda focusing on poverty in place needs to understand some of the things that were talked about yesterday as the role of public policies in creating this place, and I, uh, I would uh, echo that, but I would also emphasize, you know, the federal money, federal government money for helping to buffer some of these differences, helping to create bridges 
through uh, metro areas has just been missing. We do all our, our federal policy through tax breaks now. And uh, you know, just eating away at the, at the budget that we need to address these problems is, um, uh, is not uh, where we need to go in the future. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there, but I just say, you know, I, I was, you know, thinking about all the ways that, that, you know, what it has meant to me to work with you, Bill, and, um, you know, in some ways I think about your work, you analyze the problem, uh, you think about what the policies and you propose the policies, and then you also think about the politics, and nobody does that, puts the policy, the, the, the anal analysis of the problem, the policy, and then thinking about, well, what, is it, what are the politics? How can we make this work? So that really has had an influence on me. And the other thing I would say is just, you know, the warmth and what it means for you to, what it has meant for me throughout my career to have you as a supporter has really just meant the world to me. And I hope that I've been able to pay it forward some with my students. So I think we have about still about 15 minutes to, for, for questions. And, and there are two mics here. You, you're taking privilege. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I just wondered if uh, Professor Wilson can demonstrate the pick and roll. Yeah. <laughs> I'll be right back. Don't, don't, don't. <laughs> Okay, so if, if people could say you know who they are, this is all being recorded and archived. So and and keep their, their questions and comments brief. Hi, David Elwood, and, and this entire conference has just been a feast, and this panel was just yet another example, just head spinning and excited. I, that physical excitement you described uh, earlier, Bob Greenstein, if you're still here, yeah. uh, I just feel that the whole time. Um, <laughs> You know, but there's there's one thing, particularly now, is maybe the, the panel to ask it. Um, we spend all our time, most most of us spend all our time talking about the bottom third or the everything from so-called underclass. You're there, Bob. The underclass, whatever it is, and yet all the money's at the top. I mean, it is the one percent. It's the half of one percent. It's certainly the twenty percent. You mentioned this in passing, Vita, but. Uh, you know, it seems to me that if we're going to think about the politics of this and so forth, it always involves money. If we had money, there's lots of things we can do. We can fight about whether it's tax credits or wage credits or public jobs or, or you know, uh, allowing people to move to different neighborhoods, whatever. But without money, it's just, you're just, we're fighting amongst each other for the crumbs. And so I guess my question is, um, you know, there was this brief movement and so on. Where do we where do we land on that, and and don't we need to start incorporating that much more explicitly in our thinking about politics and ultimately uh, policy and and even our 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 discussions of class and race and so forth? Absolutely. Uh, you no, know, David, as as you know, and. Bill, I, I neglected to say that among the many other ways Bill has helped me and my organization personally is for what, more than a quarter century being a member of our board of directors. Uh, much of our central focus, both us and the groups in our state network, is on raising revenue. You don't raise revenue significantly. I mean, what are we down to now? We're down to revenues or something like 16.5% of gross domestic product. I mean, this is historically low, despite the fact that the baby boom generation is aging and all of this. I think there's a related question. Not only do we, we need to raise taxes, but what do we need to raise taxes for? So Doug and I were talking a little bit about this just before this morning's event started. Here's a conundrum. There's a bill in the House that is overwhelmingly supported by House Democrats, 210 co-sponsors that restores long-term Social Security solvency, and it raises Social Security benefits, not just for low- or middle-income people, but across the board. It fully pays for itself by increases in a variety of Social Security taxes, both at the top and payroll taxes. 
So far, it sounds great, right? The tax increases in the bill amount to 1.8% of GDP, which is about double the revenue loss from the 2017 tax cut. So that's fine if you think from a political economy standpoint that there's no limit on how high we can raise taxes as a share of GDP. I think politically, there are limits on how high we can raise taxes. And I hope we don't make the mistake of using too much of the revenue in areas like raising social security benefits for people at the top, which I didn't do, that don't really fit with what we've been talking about the last couple of days. So, yeah, I think the fundamental issue here, as you just said, David, we, we need to raise significantly more revenue, not only at the federal level, but at the state level as well. We also need to be really good about setting priorities about what that money goes for. Yeah, I'm going to say that there is no we right now. Mm. And um, we, we. there is no we making these decisions. There are contending we's. And the key to um, the politics of this still lies in finding a way to build policies that um, invoke moral themes that most Americans accept. Right. Uh, at the same time that disproportionate help is delivered to those who need it most. So uh, this is a disagreement that Bob and I have had for years. We had a debate about it. It's still taught in classes, and it's still there. Uh, but just to answer the question that was posed, do inequalities of money and the ability to deploy money in politics matter? Yes, they do. But there are two kinds that matter, the wealth donors, and the way they are organized to deliver their money, and the organization and the way in which money is spent is very disparate between the right and left and much more effective on the right. It's not the, simply the amount of money. And then when we get to the top 20%, when we talk about small donors in politics, that's who we're talking about. There are no real small donors in politics. There are wealth donors and there are salaried donors. Salary donors are also giving on both sides and are fueling a lot of the party polarization. But we need to think about how money is organizationally raised and deployed, not simply the amounts of money. Because the evidence is pretty clear that you need enough money to fight effectively in politics, but you don't need the most. Right. If the most were what mattered, even for that matter, the most votes, Hillary Clinton would be president, and we would be having a very different discussion in this uh, seminar. Uh, I'll just say uh, briefly, uh, just thinking at the metropolitan area, you know, the issue of the one, uh, the issue there is the 20 percent that Absolutely. separates itself out and guards its borders. In other words, it's us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, in the stuff that I've been doing on the Sun Belt, I mean, it's really striking. I'm looking for the rationales for the cityhood uh, movement in Atlanta, which is separating out once uh, Fulton County was taken over by African Americans. Um, there was a cityhood movement where white, wealthier places um, withdrew into their, created their own political jurisdictions. And the rationales are so interesting. It's like, well, we're 9% of the population. Well, we contributed 14% of the revenue. And it's the idea, it's almost that this checkerboard of metropolitanism, the sense of fairness is that anything that, that it leaves no room for redistribution at that level, which is why I think, but you still might get those people voting for people who voting for representatives who will raise taxes at the national level. And that's what you see now in some of those suburbs of Atlanta. So it's kind of a conundrum of the way that 20% acts in their local communities and the way they act nationally. And my sense is that you have to play on where it will work and maybe do some kind of boomerang thing and come back down to try to open opportunity at the local level. 
Florida. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Adrian Chaudhry, and um, I was a student of public policy here at Harvard and was blessed to have um, Professor Wilson um, as one of my dissertation advisors. Um, this has been a really robust panel in two days, and I have about 13 questions oh. um, <laughs> but I'm, I've, uh, that I noted in this, just this panel for uh, the three panelists and Professor Wilson, but I'm going to restrict myself to two and be really brief. Um, one is for uh, um, uh, Bob Greenstein. Um, you mentioned the Bennett Brown bill, um, uh, and I had a couple of I'm familiar with the bill and have a couple of uh, questions about um, extensions or supplements to that bill. Um, uh, Professor Wilson, I mean, actually, I think there's Scotch Poll as well, um, have talked in their work, in their writings about targeting within universalism in addition to universalism and targeting. Um, and so two ways that um, I've thought about, the, I proposed in other work, um, uh, building off the type of Bennett Brown bill that has been indicated is addressing the er periods of most disproportionate inequality that exists. One is early childhood, so to create a disproportionate early childhood yeah. child allowance. Um, I think uh, Greg Duncan and others have proposed something similar, so to make it um, inverse with age. Um, and the second is to extend, and around the EITC, is to do something in particular for uh, young adults working in the sort of 18 to 25 period who experienced economic precarity the most, and uh, the non-college, four-year college-bound um, young adults um, and uh, addressing that. Um, also, on the policy thing, would also this two other policy. Another policy I'd like to introduce is the universal child care. I know th um, Sp Professor Scotch Paul mentioned that there are two um, large bills, um, universal bills, um, one by Senator Murray and one by Senator Warren to make universal child care. I think both of which also have a chance in 2021 or 2023, depending on how things go. Um, and the third policy-related question is, Bill Wilson also talks a lot about employment and employment precarity. So I think besides income and family supports, um, I know uh, Sheldon uh, raised this yesterday in terms of debates about how to address full employment um, supports. Um, is there something on the horizon that you would recommend there? Um, my question for Theta Scotch Poll. <laughs> uh, Maybe we hold it, hold it there so other people have a chance to ask questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, the good news is that uh, almost all the things you mentioned on the tax front are actually in the Working Families Tax Relief Act. It uh, does, as I recall, have a larger child tax credit for children under, I think it's under three. We had recommended under six. Uh, they ended up going with under three. And it does extend, in addition to dramatically expanding the EITC for workers not raising children at home, currently you have to be age 25 to qualify for that. Um, oh, I think you're, you're right. I'm sorry, I'm confused. The Brown-Bennett bill takes it down to age 21, but the right. Ways and Means version is age 19. We're all supporting age 19. I think if Brown and Bennett were introducing the bill today rather than April, it would be age 19. I think there's consensus among all of us working on it. And the only reason it's 19, not 18, is that parents can claim children for the EITC through age 18, age 18, and there was a concern that if you had age 18 in both places, it would increase the error rate, which is the main source of attack that's used to uh, criticize the credit. Um, the child credit's really interesting in this debate over targeted versus universal. It's what I would call in between. So through most of its history, the child tax credit began to phase down at $110,000 a year for a married couple. Two kids phases out at $150,000. Uh, what was very interesting is in 2001, Bush proposed to raise that. We put together a counter effort. Instead of raising it at the top, add a refundable component at the bottom, and we actually beat Bush with the Republican House, the Republican Senate, and a Republican president on that. Um, now the goal is to make it fully refundable. The 2017 tax law raised the phase out on the child tax credit to about $400,000 a year. The, the view I have and everybody I'm working with on this is politically, you don't need to go to 400. The child credit was remarkably popular at the 110, 150. So what does the brown Bennett bill do? It phases it out at about 200 instead of coming down from 400, but it doesn't go way, way down. What are the Republicans doing on this, Bob? 
isn't the majority. Nah, they're, they're, that's very interesting. And it relates um, to these broader questions, too, of how best to expand them. Some people want to convert the earned income credit to certain people without earnings. I think from a political economy standpoint, I love it policy-wise. I think it's a mistake from a political EITC, the expansion is extraordinary over the years, and it's had Republican either support or acquiescence. You have a deal, Democrats ask for it, Republicans say, okay. Um, I think we would lose that if the EITC goes to people without earnings, but we want people without earnings to get cash. That's why I think that, to me, converting the child credit into a fully fundable credit, like a child allowance, which would go up to a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, I think in the income redistribution security area, that's probably the top priority here. Child care, um, there's also this, what does universal mean? So when Obama came out with his budgets, he, kept, he had universal child care. Except when you actually looked at the proposal, it was universal up to 200% of the poverty line and then phased out. To me, the question on child care is like the question on the child tax credit. I don't think you have to go all the way up the income scale, and I wouldn't want to spend the money on that because I'd rather it for other things. I wouldn't narrowly target it. I just, there's a question. What's the income level at which you're covering enough of the middle class and you're getting enough support to do it, you know, to be determined? But certainly, if and when Democrats have control of the levels of power in Washington again, I do think child care will be a major expansion. Uh, little known is that even the last two years, there was a $5 billion expansion over two years in federal funding for child care, even with the Republican Senate and President, the largest, because there was insistence on it, uh, the largest we've ever got. And I do think there is a potential, if we can raise the revenue, as David noted, for a major expansion in child care support, if and when, the political levers of control change in Washington. Yeah, just let me point out that if um, the Democrats lose in 2020, the plans are to dismantle all of the things that right. you are describing. I, I think we have to be a little bit more realistic about the situation that we're facing. Can I make one quick comment on that? Um, the efforts to dismantle things through legislation in 17 and 18, again, I'm it's really bizarre for me to be the good news person on the panel. Um, they tried to repeal the Affordable Care Act. They failed. Uh, they, they came very, very close. A man dying of cancer and two Republican women who didn't owe their... They came very, very close. You are absolutely right. And they put through a tax cut that is depriving us of the revenue we will need to do any of these things or to sustain any of these things in an adverse political environment. Couldn't agree with you more on the tax cut. As you know, we were among the leaders in opposing it. But that's, I, I want to make a different we all point it. here. Um, they didn't succeed in the Affordable Care Act. They came very close. They had big food stamp cuts that got through the House. It went to conference with the Republican Senate, and every single one of them was dropped. Now they can't do that anymore because the Democrats control the House. So we're in a new world now where they are getting significant cuts done through administrative action and executive action. And my assumption, which could be wrong, is if Trump is reelected, the Democrats will still have the House. And the threat then is for, it took them two and a half years to start to figure out how to use administrative action to skewer these programs, especially for immigrants. And we'll get four more years of that if he's reelected. By contrast, if a Democrat is president but the Republicans still control the Senate, a lot of the stuff we're talking about likely won't pass. And the challenge for a number of us then will be how do we use administrative action and executive action? to undo the things Trump did there and to make advances to the degree you're allowed to within the existing laws. In the long run, you need to change the laws, though. So we're running short on time. So why don't we just take the remaining questions, please be extremely brief, and, and then the panelists can speak to the, the parts of the questions that they're able to in the time that remains. 
Uh, thank you so much for all of your insights. Uh, my name is Madeline Dapp. I'm a student in the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at MIT. Um, and it's uh, fascinating to me to hear folks talking repeatedly about the role of labor unions in these coalitions. Um, to the extent that when the truly disadvantaged was written, manufacturers were the major powers in cities, the major political power. And in 2019, at least in my department, we talk a lot more about real estate. We talk a lot more about hedge cities and cities that have become real estate investment portfolios. Um, and so I'm curious uh, if you see these coalitions changing with the changing power on one side, if you're seeing renters federations or labor unions in other areas, and just um, I think for you know, Professor Weir, you know, who are you seeing on the ground in these cities? Um, for Professor, uh, for uh, Dr. Greenstein, you know, who are you seeing showing up to advocate who's new? And for Professor Scopel, who are you writing for that you haven't been writing for before? Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Eve Ewing. I'm a professor at the University of Chicago, and I was also blessed to have Professor Wilson on my dissertation committee. Um, so I, I uh, want to lean in more to this question about, I'm very compelled by the argument that was made by Professor Scotchpole about um, the fundamental role of white ethno-nationalism, xenophobia, white supremacy, uh, which is certainly entrenched in the Trump base, and I would also argue is present in perhaps mildly diluted forms among self-identified white moderates and liberals as well. Um, and so therefore, I'd like to ask how we reconcile that with the conversation we had yesterday about the fact that the re-entrenchment of segregation, both socioeconomic and racial, is largely manufactured and therefore preventable by policy and the necessity of that kind of bold policy making to undo the legacy of segregation, uh, how we reconcile those two things. Last question. I'm Barry Bluestone. Uh, Margaret, I was fascinated by the data that you presented, and all of a sudden I'm starting to think, how do we explain the rise of poverty in our suburbs? Is it that we have a suburban population which is downwardly mobile? Is it that we have reduced some residential segregation so that low-income people have been able to move, particularly of color, to some of our suburbs? Um, is it because, as is true here in the Boston area, that many low-income people cannot afford the rents here anymore or to purchase a coin, and have therefore moved to outlying areas. Um, I can think of 14 or 15 different hypotheses, all of which your numbers uh, suggest are important questions to answer. So, Abby, how much time can I have? <laughs> hmm? Five more minutes. Margaret should answer these questions. Mm -hmm. I'll just say for uh, Barry, um, you know, the answer is kind of all of, where are you? I like to, I like to look at, yeah. Um, you know, the, the people have been studying this rise of suburban poverty, and the answer really is all of the above, and it varies in different metro areas. Some of its um, immigrants tend to be somewhat, they're not all poor by any means, of course, but disproportionately a little bit uh, more poor than uh, Native-born uh, Americans, many uh, uh, migrate directly to suburbs because that's where the jobs are, so that's a piece of it. It's also people in the suburbs becoming more poor. It's also people getting pushed out. Um, uh, uh, not the case in, where's Paul? Not the case in Camden, but yes, the case in Boston, yes, the case in uh, New York. So it is, kind of, it is kind of all of the above. And also when you look at that drop in the share of poverty in the cities, it's it's a little bit. It it part of it means is that poor people are leaving. Yeah, They're leaving middle, the cities because there's here. just there's just nothing for them and people who can get out. You know, so in Chicago, in Chicago's lost. Forget the amount, but it's lost like twenty five thousand black people. Yes, it's yeah. like what wow. what is there for in these neighborhoods that have been so disinvested? What is there for where they? took the schools away, what's there for people? So, so, I mean, these are really changing what we think about as metro areas, and we need to, you know, find a way to understand what these processes are and understand that, that our policies are really not set up. We need place-based policies, but they're really not set up for this new political geography. And I just say one thing about the real estate agents. Yes, real estate agents. I mean, they're a classic 
kind of Dita Scotchpole federated organization with superpower at the local level, the state level, the federal level. I once stayed in a hotel uh, in D.C., and I realized that this enormous building across from me was the National Association of Home Builders. And like, this is, these are powerful organizations. And I guess the thing I would say, though, is that, you know, real estate Real estate is a funny business. They like to build. Builders like you, sometimes they're not all on the same side. Builders like to build. You can get builders on your side. Sometimes they want to build more affordable housing. A lot of the blocks are with that twenty percent that don't want affordable housing in their neighborhoods. So I think you know, yes, real estate is a big problem, but real estate can work in different ways towards actually creating more affordable housing and kind of strategies that bring them in are more likely to be successful. I just would add one thing. I think, and it's very evident in Margaret's work, people who study public policy and who plan public policies and who think about the politics that can get behind, protect, and expand public policies have to say the word federation to themselves about 50 times a day. We do not live in a national political system. We live in a collection of jurisdictions. And it is as American as apple pie to try to move to a new one and exclude the people you want to exclude. It's been going on since the beginning. And we now have a new form of that, which is definitely harnessing a lot more than the top 1%. In fact, the top 1% don't really care because they don't live anywhere, for sure. Uh, it's the top 20% who are very concerned about safety, schools, uh, and that's true for African-American top 20% as well as white and Hispanic. And so it is the politics of figuring out how to rope them into broader coalitions. And I just want to say something hopeful. I do think a civil war is occurring in the American middle class. And in some ways, it's the, the good thing Trump has done, there's really nothing, but uh, is, is to, to create a moral frame for that. What's it mean, define the civil war? It means that American middle class people are fighting over what kind of country this is. Mm -hmm. Is it a country that's hopeful, that's innovative, that's inclusive, that wants to um, build on diversity and uh, improve uh, life chances. Uh, let's face it, a lot of upper middle class people vote for redistributive policies, at least at the national level. Yes. Uh, or is it a fearful country that, is, uh, that, that secretly thinks we're in decline, we're threatened, that Im immigration we haven't talked about enough, because that's the real form in which racial exclusionary politics is being stoked uh, now, even more than black-white. And uh, I think that civil war is moralized now. It's not just about economics. And that's probably good, because most American middle class people, including whites, do not really want a fearful uh, wall-building, dividing country. And this election is going to be about that, uh, I think. Uh, let me. Yeah, I just wanted to make a brief comment. One of the questions raised it as well as earlier discussions in the last two days about labor unions. Mm, very pretty well appreciated that the decline of unions is a significant contributing factor to increased inequality, flat wages, issues in working conditions. What is much less well appreciated is the role of the decline in unions in affecting policy debates in Washington and state legislatures on social justice issues. Yeah, particularly when, the, when the I came to, sector. When I came to Washington in 1972, on almost every major social justice issue, including creating and expanding both universal and targeted programs, the coalitions were led by the labor unions. My first mentor <laughs> was an official of what was then called the Amalgamated Meat Cutters Union, who was this brilliant strategist who was the mastermind of how to really build the food stamp program and a number of others. The unions, by and large, don't do that anymore. A couple of years ago, I had a conversation with one of the top people in the AFL-CIOs, maybe a year ago, and he said, look, Bob, we had like 25, 30 percent of the private labor force then. 
We could do all those things. Our survival is now in jeopardy. We have shrunken greatly. We can't have as broad a focus. We've got to focus on preserving and trying to build back membership and key things. On, and he wasn't wrong. I'm not saying this as a critique of unions at all. But the withdrawal of a fundamental part, one of the most powerful parts, of the social justice coalition, especially for the kinds of programs we're all talking about, has made a big difference. And it's, in my view, yet another reason, apart in addition to inequality wages, where it's another reason why the fate of labor unions, do they go back up or do they continue to decline, is intersected with a lot of the other issues we've been talking about. Yeah, and nobody knows that more than the American right. Absolutely. They haven't just withdrawn. They've been smashed. Yeah. I would like to say that California is something of an exception, and it is yeah. good to look at California and see what the future might look like in a better world. Yeah. <laughs> it's giving you an is coming for you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's anecdotal, but it's quite interesting. And Can you take a mic? Oh, I'm sorry. Here. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a lot of fun doing a TV show everyone knows. It's called Finding Your Roots. It's very popular. Um, it's the second most popular show on PBS after Antique Roadshow. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> now, who's the audience? The primary audience is quite diverse. Of course, I have a strong black audience. But the reason it's number two is because of 45 to 65 year old white middle class people, the same people that you're talking about. And I find that very fascinating. And people come up to me with Trump signs and say, I don't like your politics, but I love your show. And what is the show about? It is about how we're all immigrants and how under the skin, despite phenotypic differences, we're 99.9% .9 the same. That is worthy of consideration. Uh, I don't know why, I don't know what it means, but I do know that those are the facts. You know, it's why the romance with immigration um, is it about a nostalgia of the past or is it, you know, you would think that given everything that you say, people would demonize immigration or minimize its role. But we celebrate immigration and diversity every week. And this year we are expanding from 10 weeks to 16 weeks because of its popularity. It's just something to think about. Yeah, you know, I, I, I want to say that... Um This civil war that's happening inside the middle class is much more about abstractions that play in politics than it is about what people actually will say about their own lives, their families' lives, or even their neighbor. They can they can be against uh, they can be all for building the wall and at the same time say not the not the Latino I know, but they'll they'll say Hispanic if they're conservative, but. I've actually sat down with Tea Partiers and talked with them about the very issue that you're saying. And, you know, so I'll say, um, um, what do you think about Trump's, uh, 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 you know, immigration uh, crackdown? Well, people have got to follow the rules. Uh, and I said, well, I, I, I'm not really sure they did follow. I'm very gentle in these. I, I, I'm not so sure they did follow the rules back then. Um, but people will say, and they'll start talking about their Italian or their Polish ancestors. And they just look at me, they just look through me when I say that. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it takes a genius to figure out what this means. I think it means uh, the same thing it's always meant throughout American history. Every period of rapid immigration has given way from the 1840s right through the, to, to a right-wing response to it, and the people who are already here have ganged up to consider the ones who are newly arriving in numbers they don't like to be other, to be black, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, these racial categories are not biological. They are cultural. And so I, I but that is the reality that we're in right now. And that's part of the reason why there is an argument uh, over, 
over something like immigration and the rules of immigration at the heart of the fights over race that also are targeting African Americans. And I think the side of that that's central now is coming up in the next panel. And that's fights over law enforcement, and which is locally governed, but now nationally visible. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, you know, those two things, there's a perfect storm that, that Trump and Trumpism and the Tea Party have taken strong advantage of. So it's fascinating and instructive, not uplifting, but terrific. Please, <laughs> thank you for Well, uh, one thing that Trump
Everyone should sit down. I'm a former judge. If you don't, there will be consequences. Yeah, no, but I have the power. I had the power. It, it's amazing. Is your mic on? My mic is on, yes. My mic is on. I have things to throw at people. Um, my name is Nancy Gertner. Uh, I was a late entrant to this, uh, to this group. So uh, I want to introduce myself for a second. Uh, I was um, a judge for 17 years on the federal court in Massachusetts. Uh, before that, I was a civil rights and criminal defense lawyer. One of my best clients just had to leave. I represented Theda Scotchpole in her. Yes, that's right. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and so after a, a career as a criminal defense and civil rights lawyer, I became a federal judge, which was remarkable. Uh, and after that, in 2011, I decided to leave the bench for the purpose of uh, teaching at Harvard Law School and to enable me to speak. My husband now says that now that I can speak, I can't shut up. <laughs> and of course, there's, there's, something, there's something to that. Um, I'm only the moderator on this with, two, with three very remarkable scholars uh, in honor of Professor Wilson. So my, uh, my role is sort of agent provocateur, which I like. Uh, as I also like to say, my chances on the Supreme Court were long ago shot, so it doesn't matter what I say. Uh, my life ha does, has not intersected with Professor Wilson in the way others have here, um, and really more's the pity. I was always an odd lawyer type. Um, I had gone to graduate school in political science at Yale, then I went to law school uh, at Yale as well, and I took law and sociology for the entire time. When I left law school, uh, I hadn't had to take a bar exam. I had no idea what they were talking about. Um, I, those of you who know anything about law, that I passed it was remarkable. I thought dying intestate was a disease. <laughs> you know, prostate, it had something intestinal flavor to it. Um, so my connections to the, to the subject are that uh, for 17 years, um, I sentenced men, largely men, largely African-American men, to sentences to prison, sentences 80% of which I believe to be disproportionate, unjust, and unfair. And I believe this as I was doing it. I knew it as I was doing it. And my charge upon leaving the bench is to write about that to write about the men that I sentenced to whom I'm now meeting, to write about what it is like to be a judge in a regime with which you so completely uh, disagree. Um, the language of law is not the language you all are speaking, although in working with Bruce on various projects, which I'll tell you about in a minute, I've learned to try to figure out what the translation is. Law asks, sometimes asks questions about um, why, sometimes you ask questions, why is this applying? Why is this particular provision involved here? We rarely ask questions about how. How did it come to pass that I was doing what I was doing? How did it come to pass that I was enforcing laws which we know to have been racist? How does it come to pass? We rarely ask those questions, and perhaps it's because it would be so excruciating if we did. I must have said something interesting. <laughs> um, but one of the interesting things about having a discussion as a lawyer in this group is that you want, really need to unpack, then, the things that we took for granted and didn't ask the question of how they came about, the tropes that we used. This amount of imprisonment was important for public safety. Well, Bruce's work suggests just the opposite. Uh, this person was violent and should be specially treated. Well, again, Bruce's work suggests, I'm not sure I could tell the difference in some settings between the men I sentenced who were violent and those who were victims of violence and those who were witnesses to violence. 
I should throw the book at people who are in gangs. Well, I've come to realize that the gangs with whom that I was studying, that I sentenced, were communities and neighborhoods with social relationships, social relationships, not gang relationships, so deep that when I visited a man a few weeks ago in prison, the last person that I had sentenced to still in prison, um, he said to me that the men that he grew up with kept on putting uh, money in his canteen. This was the gang. This was the terrible gang I was supposed to be throwing the book at. Uh, tropes about school. Uh, somehow it should matter that all of the men that I sentenced had dropped out of school. What I didn't know when I was a judge is that 90% of them went to, to uh, Jeremiah Burke High School, which had lost its accreditation while they were there. So I'm learning to ask the, the how question. And I said yes to this wonderful uh, uh, program because I wanted very much to ask that how question, broadly speaking, with all of you. The panel is to die for. Let me start with Bruce Western, whom I know the best. So Bruce, Bruce and I taught a course in mass incarceration at Harvard Law School three years ago, and then he left me. <laughs> Bruce is now the, yeah, I'm not personalizing this. Bruce is now the Bryce Professor of Sociology and Social, Social Justice, co-director of the Justice Lab at Columbia University. His research concerns the causes, scope, and consequence of mass incarceration. Uh, he is currently the principal investigator of the Square One Project, which is a remarkable uh, criminal justice project whose goal is to reimagine public policy responses to violence under con conditions of poverty and racial inequality. I am part of that project. It is the high point of my year to go and participate. Likewise, he was vice chair of the National Academy of Sciences panel on the, the causes and consequences of high incarceration and was a participant in its report, Punishment and Inequality in, in America. Um, then we will turn to uh, Professor Khalil Muhammad, who um, I just met. Bruce told me, it was, very, it was a wonderful conversation we just had. Oh, you're the Nancy that Bruce told me we should connect to teach this course again. So I'm after you. Um, uh, professor Muhammad is a historian, professor of history, race, and policy, Harvard Kennedy School and the Radcliffe Institute. Institute. He was previously director of the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture at the New York Public Library, and before that, a professor of history uh, at Indiana. Um, his work, uh, he was also a contributor to the 2014 National Research Study, The Growth of Incarceration in the U.S., uh, and his work is a staple of New York Times, New Yorker, Washington Post, The Nation, MSNBC, etc. cetera. Um, I, if I, the, uh, the introductions will take up too much of the panel, so I will move on. And the third speaker will be Professor Goff, who's a social psychologist at the John Jay S College of Criminal Justice, previously at UCLA and Stanford. Uh, his research is on race, but is intersectional, looks at identity-based inequality with respect to gender, sexuality, class, and uh, ableness. Uh, he is the Franklin A. Thomas Professor of Policing Equity at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I'll stop here uh, because it's, we've, it's just too much. I will, I will throw a question at each of the speakers. They will answer that question. And then what we envisioned was something different than the other panels, which is we envisioned a conversation. Um, at one point, it's possible that I may have to immediately get up and leave. Why would that be? My daughter-in-law was due on Wednesday for their first grandchild. So we think we have time. But just in case, if I disappear, it has nothing to do with the quality of the participants. So let me start with Bruce. Uh, Bruce talks about Bill Wilson's impact on his work and wants to, ask, wants to, to consider how Bill's research on mass incarceration, how, I'm sorry, how the research on mass incarceration has been influenced by Bill's work and life work. Bruce? Yeah, th uh, thanks so much, Nancy. And uh, 
I want to begin by saying, uh, you know, uh, I'm just overwhelmed by uh, what a uh, what an extraordinary program we've uh, seen over these last few days, and um, what a great privilege uh, it's been to participate in this celebration of Bill's uh, work and uh, his his career and. Uh, uh, thanks very much to uh, Skip and uh, all the organisers for allowing me uh, to be part of these events. Uh, uh, Bill's example and uh, his friendship uh, uh, are one of the things I, I absolutely uh, treasure about my uh, very precious time at Harvard. So uh, thank you very much for uh, having me here today. Um, so... Uh, in, you know, I've, I was, uh, I've been thinking a lot about this, uh, this question that Nancy posed. What's the connection of Bill's uh, analysis of uh, urban poverty and uh, race and inequality in America to the phenomenon of mass incarceration? And, and just for a, a tiny bit of empirical context, so uh, over the last 40 years, since the early 1970s, uh, Prison and jail populations in America have grown steadily. And if we go back to those uh, early 70s, there are uh, about 200,000 people or so in uh, prisons and jails in America. There's now uh, over 2 million uh, people uh, in uh, prisons and jails in America. If we count the community corrections population, people under probation and parole supervision, there's about 7 million people uh, right now. Uh, in America who are under some sort of correctional control and these very, very high rates uh, of uh, correctional supervision, state supervision, have really only emerged uh, in the last decade or, uh, decade or so. America accounts for about 5% of the world's population but about 25% of the world's prisoners. Um, so this is mass incarceration. Now, uh, as striking as these numbers are, I don't think that's uh, what's most important uh, about mass incarceration. What's most important about it is uh, the unequal distribution of incarceration across the population. So as the prison population was increasing from the early 1970s into the 2000s, nearly all of the growth in imprisonment was concentrated among the non-college fraction of the population. Incarceration rates for people who had at least some college education barely changed at all over the last uh, 40 years. But incarceration rates uh, increased enormously uh, for people with uh, just a high school diploma or, and in particular, for people who hadn't finished, uh, uh, finished high school. And, of course, there is a massive racial disparity in incarceration. African Americans are about five times more likely, uh, five to six times more likely to be incarcerated than whites. You put these two inequalities together, and it means uh, we've seen the emergence of really astonishing rates of imprisonment, particularly among African American men, recent birth cohorts of African American men with very low levels of schooling. Uh, among high school dropouts, among uh, black men who haven't finished high school, we estimate that about 70% of them are going to go to prison at some point in their lives. And this is a very deep end of the criminal justice system. This is a felony conviction, 28 months uh, at the median of time served in a state or federal uh, state or federal facility. And many of them, of course, are serving much longer sentences, uh, sentences than that. So how does this story uh, connect to Bill's work? Uh, the people that have come uh, to fill uh, Americans, uh, America's prisons uh, are precisely those that uh, are struggling uh, most deeply uh, with uh, all of the social problems uh, associated with uh, concentra uh, concentrated poverty in uh, uh, very disadvantaged communities of colour and, uh, in particular, uh, the, the problem of chronic joblessness that um, the, the Bill analysed paradigmatically in, uh, in the truly disadvantaged. And I think when, when I was starting to work on uh, this problem... Uh, Bill's research and uh, his understanding, uh, his analysis of uh, particularly 
uh, black men's unemployment in uh, America's inner cities. This was so much uh, in, uh, in my DNA, and that, uh, that's what it was that led me uh, uh, to consider uh, these uh, disparities in incarceration and, uh, and see this uh, extraordinary rate of punitive institutionalisation uh, among black men. So that's one point. Uh, second point is that uh, in the truly disadvantaged, uh, there's uh, an analysis, an unflinching analysis, uh, of the social problem of violence. And, uh, and I think often in the conversation about mass incarceration uh, and, and certainly the advocacy uh, around criminal justice reform, uh, we tend uh, to minimise actually, uh, the problem of community violence. And, uh, and Bill was uh, unflinching and path-breaking uh, in the truly disadvantaged uh, uh, to analyse it. And then in later work with, uh, with Rob Sampson, uh, he provides this more elaborated ecological uh, analysis of the spatial concentration of violence, particularly in disadvantaged communities of colour. It's a very different way of thinking about violence than our criminal justice system. Our criminal justice system uh, divides uh, the world in you know, the simplistic moral universe uh, between uh, the guilty few uh, that prey uh, on the innocent, uh, the innocent many, and the job of the system uh, is to, to punish the, the guilty few. Uh, Bill's analysis uh, was ecological, environmental. It wasn't people... Uh, uh, that were violent. It was social contexts uh, that were violent. So the great implication there, I think, is that justice is not found in punishing violent people, which was the impetus behind punitive criminal justice policy. Justice is found in the abatement of violent contexts. And, uh, 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 and that was a very powerful idea for me. And one implication is that people who grow up in such contexts are exposed to violence in all sorts of ways. Violence isn't a disposition that inheres in the individual. Uh, it's, a, it, it's structurally pro, uh, produced by the, the social environment. And it means that people who have in their lives perpetrated serious violence, have been exposed to violence in many other ways, and often it means there are long histories, beginning very early in childhood, uh, of exposure to violence as victims and witnesses. And there is an awful lot of trauma uh, among people who are deeply involved in the criminal justice system uh, that we have barely begun to consider. And I think it, it, if we take that seriously... Uh, it changes uh, the moral equation uh, that has driven the whole project uh, of mass incarceration. Uh, last point I, I want to make uh, very quickly, and I, I, I was really 